Awesome. Like Andrea said, welcome. Uh, we're going to start off the web clinic doing um, sort of an icebreaker. So if um, I guess we'll just call on people since it's hard and everyone's sort of little Brady Bunch boxes are a little bit different. Um, but your name and where you're currently located, like what your sort of mental happy place is and any previous experience or interest in trail running, like why you wanted to do this today and what you're hoping to get out of the clinic. Um, do you want to kick off first, Jen? Sure. Um, I apologize for my dog already. She, you're going to hear her whining <laughs> like that. She's trying to talk with me. Um, so my name is Jen Johnson. I am currently a PhD student in Pullman. I'm sticking around uh, for a few more weeks and then hopefully defending and finishing up. Um, my mental happy place, even though she might be annoying, is outside with my dog. I've been doing that a lot lately. <laughs> I will say that. Uh, we walk like eight miles a day just because that's my break from the rest of the world. Previous experience in trail running. Um, I, I'll say this many times throughout this webinar. I do not define myself as a runner, but I actually enjoy trail running. So I am from Arizona, hence my background. Um, and I actually started trail running in the desert environment. So it's possible. It's hot sometimes, but you can do it. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's very different from actual running, at least mindset wise for me. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And goals is just, you know, to hopefully provide some cool information, answer any questions you all have and in like increase interest in some trail running. I am Hannah. I'm also an adventure facilitator through the ORC. I'm one of the graduate assistants. I'm getting my master's in teaching and I teach high school chemistry. Um, and my mental happy place is like, in the evening after you've hiked or backpacked up to a lake and it's a really hot day and you're sweaty and you're tired and you go and it's a really cold lake and you dive in and that's the feeling when you enter the water and it's so cold and then you do like a big swim and you get a brain freeze and then you come out of the water and you feel like you've been like born again. That is my mental happy place. Um, and previous experience or interest in trail running. So I think I've did a lot. I've done a lot of trail running in my life without knowing that it was that. Um, I ran track and cross country at University of Idaho when I was an undergrad um, and we would run at Moscow Mountain all the time but I was like hey this is training but actually apparently it was trail riding um, and I wish I could do more now. Uh, it's been a really nice way to sort of have a lower impact and just like more joy in the process rather than sort of like pounding pavement so they've got some people training for half marathons here so I'll try not to knock on, um, on non trail running too hard. Uh, and goals for the clinic are just, I don't know, just like Jen said, interest in the sport, um, because I think it can be intimidating or people are like, oh, I don't see myself as a runner or a trail runner. And like, we're going to talk about like you, everyone is a runner. Like, do you, do you run? Do you put one foot in front of the other? Like, right. You qualify. Um, and how it's really more about like your journey as an individual rather than like what sort of like counts as a trail runner. Um, but I think with that, we'll sort of dive in. So what is trail running and why trail run? Um, it's basically like, if you remember in high school, you could run cross country. It's kind of just like that, except you call the shots. You can go as far as you want. You can go as short as you want. You can go as fast as you want. You can also go as slow as you want. You can walk if some if you want. So it's all whatever you fills what your purpose is for that day. And like, I think it's kind of interesting, like what counts as trail running? Like, I guess anything that's technically not pavement. So there's plenty of like little trails and stuff in town that get you in the feeling of like, oh, I'm having to pay more attention about where I'm putting my feet and stuff. And it's just kind of a different ball game than normal running. There's also lots of gravel and farming roads if you're in Pullman um, that are great for kind of getting used to a little bit more uneven ground. Logging and forest service roads can also be really great because they're generally not too steep and they're pretty wide and they're kind of easy to get to. Um, and you can social distance on them. And also trails, urban and county and state park trails are a lot of great ones. For people who are training for half marathons, trail running can be awesome because you'll get your heart rate up, but your body doesn't have to work as hard, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like obviously it is hard on your muscles and they hurt as you're going up the hill, but you're running way slower. You're decreasing that impact. So it can kind of be a great recovery um, to put in some more trail runs, especially if like you take those really steep parts and you walk those. Um, and lot, way easier on those joints, your ankles and things like that. 
also really great to start practicing sort of getting your pop quads pounded when you train for a marathon or a half marathon and there's our downhill so it kind of helps get your body ready for that stuff it's also obviously great cardiovascular benefits and you'll get a lot stronger when you're running you're kind of on pavement or on the track you're always in one same plane right you're sort of hitting your body and working your body in the same exact repetitive motion over and over and over again. But because of how dynamic trail running can be, you can really strengthen yourself outside of just that single plane as you're sort of trying to dodge a rock or move around this way and that way. So it can make you a more versatile and strong, stable athlete. Um, and then from a mental standpoint, it's just really nice, quiet time. Also a way for you to enjoy nature. Maybe you don't have time to go on an eight mile hike, but you have time for a 20 minute run in the woods. Like that's awesome. And then also it can kind of be, you can just explore too. Like you can move a little faster when you're running versus hiking. So you'd be like, oh, I'm gonna take a shortcut down this trail and see what's down there. Um, so there's lots of benefits that are definitely not touched on this page. These are just a few of them based off of what people have said their sort of goals are. Um, and the ones that I thought of. Do you have anything to add, Jen? No, I think I think that really hits it. And this is where I said I wasn't, I'm not really a runner, but I really enjoy trail running is um, I have knee and arch problems. I have plantar fasciitis from soccer mostly. So it's that repetitive same motions for, you know, 15, 20 years of my life. Um, but on trails, it's a softer surface. It's like a full body workout more than anything. So it's less repetitive stress because you have inclines, obstacles, declines, you're switching it up, you're walking. Um, so yeah, I think this gets at it, but it's great. And yes, you get a much more interesting views than most running um, on, on, you know, asphalts or what. Mm -hmm. And depending on what kind of program you're on training for a marathon, like you might be going based off miles, but sort of, it's kind of nice to go off minutes. You won't cover as many miles trail running, but you like will still be getting a lot of benefits in that amount of time. So I don't know. I think trail running is a great thing to do for recovery. Once you kind of train your body up a little bit, because the first time you trail on, you'll be like, wow, my quads are on fire. Cause I just <laughs> climbed this hill. Um, but after you're kind of acclimated a little bit, it can be a really great tool for you as you're training for other running adventures. Yeah, and with that, like the time kind of flies because you get distracted by more things, I guess. I don't know, your mind wanders. It's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, so just kind of like tips to get started, right? You want to, you don't know how. It seems like we don't have a lot of experience, which is perfect. Um, but a couple things you can try. So this is how I did it is I made my dog come. <laughs> um, I didn't want to go by myself. Didn't really know what I was doing or what to expect. It did add the extra, you know, challenge of, pacing and avoiding rocks and such when she's really excited when she sees a bird or something but um it just made it more fun you know and more enjoyable and when she needed to stop and sniff it gave me a break <laughs> for it. like physically I got a break um but also just let me you know enjoy the area so bring a friend bring a pet um and actually the ORC for the first time is offering some trail running clinics this semester which we'll talk about at the end so There'll be nice, easy, starting beginner trail running um, clinics, which should be, should be a lot of fun, which gets to the second point, right? Start small. Um, like you said, or a few of you at least, you hike already, right? So it's just like as simple as here's a nice flat area. It's pretty open, wide. Just do a little jog there. And then, you know, you get to an incline, you hike up it and you get to a decline, you can jog down and just adding small amounts of running into your normal hiking um, is a great way to start. And then as Hannah already said, right, it's really what you want it to be. Um, a lot of people, like there are there are ultra marathon trail runners, like that is a thing. There are competitions and races and really intense obstacle courses. That is only if you want that, right? Otherwise for me, like I said, it's a way for me to exercise, to get outside and I really wanna enjoy it. So that's how I make it. It's just as much of a hike and fun enjoying exercise than, you know, endurance focused. But yeah, just a couple tips, Hannah, anything else or any um, questions? Oh, yes. Any questions you have at any time, you can throw those yeah. in the chat or mm -hmm. unmute. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think sometimes when we think of like ultra, like think of trail running, you think of like this, like really like skinny, muscly dude with a backpack and all this like really bright clothing. And I don't know, they're just like really intense and kind of off-putting, but like, that is not what a trail runner is. A trail runner is like all of you. <laughs> so that's kind of- I had that, that exact experience. I was hiking outside of McCall. I forget when it was and they, they like, there was a bunch of people at the trailhead or whatever. And they were, they, oh, our friends are running a race. And it was like a 
hundred mile through the yeah. mountains around McCall like that. And I was like, okay, I'm intimidated. This is scary. I don't, I'm like struggling to hike up to the lake. And there's people that are on like mile 98 coming down at me. And I was like, oh. Yeah. yeah. And um, as someone who was a collegiate athlete, I can say that you all qualify as a trail runner. Like it's, the, you don't have to be some certain level. Like I feel okay saying that. Um, and I'll fight anyone who wants to <laughs> disagree. Um, <laughs> so those are, those are some good ideas to get started. Now we're going to talk about gear a little bit, but before we go to the next slide, which has a lot of gear on it, you probably have all the things that you need to start. Yeah. But this is just like, if you're wondering, don't get swindled into REI. Now you know kind of what the different things are or why you need them is sort of a base for starting like, oh, if I wanted to get these things, but you probably already have the things that you need. Um, so I don't know what time people take these kind of photos. Um, maybe this is your type of private person, maybe not. Um, but the first thing is a water bottle. Like even when I'm running out in the summer on the sort of gravel roads, there is zero shade and it is very hot in the Palouse. And so like a water bottle is like kind of a good idea regardless. Um, so I think that that can be a great thing to bring with you. They have some that you can fit on your hand or wear as like a little fanny pack or something like that. But if it's going to be hot or you're going to be in an exposed area, even if it's a really short run, it's never a bad idea to bring that. Um, and then you'll want to have specific shoes for running. So you all said like, oh, I do some running and some hiking. You might have something between those two. So normal running shoes won't really have as much traction. So depending on the season. So right now trails are going to be muddy. So you probably would want something with a bit more traction. But in the summer, that might not be the case. Although it's like a lot of pine needles and stuff like that, you could want more traction. So there are specific trail running shoes. The other thing specific trail running shoes have in them is often called a rock plate which is like if you step on rock that's really pointy it's not going to hurt your foot as bad because there's a piece of metal in the shoe that kind of protects your foot a little bit more and they usually have kind of a more rugged upper i know like road running shoes are usually pretty light because they don't you don't want to like have things way more on your feet but in trail running they don't get cut up as much and they last like quite a bit longer and usually a little bit more protection around your big toe should you stub it um, so those are some features that you'll often see in trail running shoes, but if, as you're just starting out, like you can use what you have and then go from there. If you're like, oh, I'm really slipping around, um, or other things like that. And then comfortable socks, because if you're like me, you're a sweaty person and your feet sweat. So it's good to keep blisters at a minimum. Um, and just like with hiking, you want clothing that is going to protect you from the sun and also not make you really cold. So things that are made out of cotton, if they, you sweat in them, then they make you really chilly. So if it's the summer, that's probably a great idea. Um, but if it's um, kind of shoulder season like it is now, you want your sweat to get whipped away and not cling to you and make you chilly. And especially if you were to like roll an ankle and have to walk out or something, you don't want to then get super, super cold. Um, another piece of gear is food. You can always stash a little bit of a snack like in your hip belt or something like that, some jowls or whatever, depending on if you're someone who gets really hungry during a run. Um, I think usually if you're going on a run that's not too long, you usually don't need food, but if you wanna be super prepared, you can obviously do that. Um, and then for longer adventures, some people are like, hey, I'm going on like a 10 mile hike today and I'm gonna run some of it and I'm gonna hike some of it. Um, you can have a pack and then you can put some other things in there like a headlamp if you think you might be out later, a spot device if you're worried or somewhere where you don't have cell service, extra layer if you think it might get cold or you'll have to walk then you can bring a jacket with you, a little first aid kit, something to filter water with, something to navigate with. So kind of like just light versions of what you would take with you hiking. Um, but it sounds like we're just wanting to get started into the sport. And so you really will need sort of the minimal side of these things. And then and Hannah, really quick. Um, I don't know if you, if I missed it, but on the list, there's also teepee and trowel. Oh yeah. I, I did miss that. I guess. Yeah. So this is, um, especially, you know, if you're going a little bit further into like the backcountry wilderness, um, there you, you run, you have to go to the bathroom, right? It's just, it's a bodily function, bodily reaction. Um, and so just having that in your fanny pack, in your backpack, whatever you're using, um, when you're out in the backcountry will make your life a lot more enjoyable and it's a much better run. Um, and then the other thing looks like Aaron, you have a comment in the chat. Um, yeah, so kind of like Hannah was saying for clothing, that wicking sweat, um, it's more important for socks if you're going like a much further distance, right? Because like cotton socks that just soak up all that sweat tend to rub, you get blisters a little bit easier. 
versus like smart wool or there's like smart wick socks that are like polyester based um that doesn't hold as much of the moisture in so for running especially longer distances again mm -hmm. that just helps avoid some of those maybe painful foot injuries that you can get um, a little bit better again if you're starting out use what you have right and you see what works for you cotton socks work for like some marathon people right it might work for you it might be fine but tends not to be because it holds that moisture and causes that rubbing that friction yeah i guess one thing i didn't put on here that's kind of, kind of interesting maybe if you're in like a more dusty climate like there can have be gaiters to put over your shoes i don't know if you've ever seen those but they kind of attach and so if you're going to be there are some interesting places you can run like tons of sand and things like that like it can help you not have to stop all the time to get little pebbles and stuff out of your shoes um but for most climates i'd say it's not real that's not really needed but you will see them and some trail runners like to use them because they're like oh look at my style of my gaiters which is pretty dorky but um you know everyone's got their own style um awesome and so here's here's a what you will see if you go to rei all of these different packs they look really intense but basically it's like hey i don't want my backpack to bump like jump up and down and like i want it to stay close to my body i don't want it to weigh very much and i want it to have pockets and stuff <laughs> so if you were going to do something longer there's a whole bunch of pockets so you could have your phone some water bottles some food but like for just going out on a trail run i don't bring a pack if i'm going and it's like i would go on a hike without a pack so you don't really need to bring this unless you want to have something in water. I would say what's way better is one of those handheld water bottles or like fanny pack type type of thing. Also, because the more stuff you have on you, the more likely it's going to chafe and like not be great. <laughs> I will say the first time I went out like a longer distance, I didn't want a full back. Well, I didn't want to buy a full backpack. First of all, I have a fanny pack because I'm a really cool person. And so I just tried using that. And it just bumped up and down like the whole time. It was super annoying. I ended up like strapping it kind of like across my chest, which kind of worked. So like practice and use it a little bit indoors before you take something out onto the trail, just because if it's bothering you the whole time, it's going to be annoying. So just mm -hmm. fun, fun tip. <laughs> yeah. All the cool kids wear fanny packs. Yeah, they do. I think I own like three now. <laughs> yeah, I definitely own a fanny pack. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this one's a little slow coming because we now are, have no more snow. But if uh, you go somewhere that still has snow, um, it's just another kind of equipment component to consider um, is just thinking about it, right? Walking around town and tennis shoes on snow doesn't work so well. So imagine running. Um, but there are a few like traction options. So I've only tried Yak Tracks because that's what I own normally. And I will say it wasn't as uncomfortable or awkward as I thought it would be running like trail running with yak tracks but it definitely kind of have to get used to it a little bit um and i felt sometimes it was a little rolly mm -hmm. because it's like those spiral cords right so the other options are micro spikes which are a little intense um as you can see but they real it's that's traction right you're not you're not slipping or sliding or going anywhere with those um and then i do like the making the ice shoes one so this one i did not know until we put this together um, but as you can see, you can literally just use screws in tennis shoes and make your own. And it's just that little bit of traction that you need. So you don't have to buy anything. I don't know the comfort level with that or if a screw is going to like pop through and hit my foot. <laughs> so I made these this year and nice. it costs about $2. So really on the good financial side of things. And you do need to make sure that you aren't using minimalist shoes so that you want so the spike end up, ends up being like this. So you want it to be at least twice as much cushion for that amount. Or if there's a rock plate in your shoe to begin with, then you don't have to worry about it. But like most Nikes like are not gonna work for this. <laughs> um, so I would test it out first. And plus you're not really putting the, sh depending on how you wanna do it, I would recommend don't put the spikes where you're gonna land, which seems counterintuitive, but like you're definitely not gonna spike yourself if you put it on the perimeter of the shoe, but you're still gonna get some traction. And if you find that, oh, I do have a rock plate and it's not a problem, then you can put it in those more air, those areas that need more traction. But this actually works really well. And then it's either an old pair of shoes, you don't mind like kind of busting up and then they're just like your winter pair or when it's really crazy out. Even just like if you're regular running, like you probably need these <laughs> in the winter around here. Um, but I, some people have said like you can take them out too and they're fine. So 
at your own risk. And there's a lot of good stuff on the internet. If you like, just look up making my own ice shoes, like every, everyone's uncle made a video about it already. <laughs> <laughs> everyone's uncle. Uh, nice. So that's shoes. And then just clothing in general. Um, this is something where you're going outside, it's freezing, right? So you're going to be dressing warmly. You don't want to be freezing when you get started. Your muscles are really tight, right? Not going to end well. Um, so dress warmly and then just adjust, right? Don't leave the layers on. Don't start sweating too much. You remove the glove. I know gloves are usually like the last thing to come off for me, but the hat comes off, the outer jacket comes off, that kind of thing, um, just to move through. And then depending on how the how the trip goes, right? Maybe I need to walk some more. You just throw the layers back on, which is kind of nice. But again, winter, just like anything, a few more things to consider um, as you go out. Yeah, and I always do the like really cool fourth grader thing where I bring a jacket and then when I take it off, I tie it around. You know, it's how you tie it around your waist. I did and that today. Might as walk. <laughs> it was warm today. Yeah. My favorite piece of running gear, I think, is my wind jacket because mm -hmm. it's really windy around here. So if it's really cold, it's going to trap in heat and then keep get you warm. And then you can just take it off. And if you're running in a, if you've ever run in a rain jacket, it doesn't do a good job because you sweat <laughs> and it gets rainy. So the wind jacket's great because it's not trying to be a rain jacket. It's just saying, I'm going to protect you from the wind and holding your heat. And it's great. So that is it's one piece of gear. Jacket. <laughs> like if you are looking for a good piece of winter gear, that's like something I really would recommend. <laughs> it's awesome. I do wear mine a lot. Nice. Any questions about anything with gear? It's a lot of information I know. But like I said, start with what you have, see what works, see what doesn't, and go from there. The more you get into it. Mm -hmm. All right. So some techniques. How is trail running different than regular running? So um, there's a lot of good tips to keep in mind. So when you're trail running, you can kind of shorten up your stride a bit. And that just allows you to be a little bit more athletic, right? Because you, if you're taking these big old strides, like you might decide that you want to change your direction, but it's too late because you're already like mid step. Um, so you can shorten your strides up a bit to give you a lot more adaptability with the terrain. Um, and then similar to normal running, you kind of want to have a relaxed upper body. Like your upper body should be working for you, not against you. And when you use your arms, your arms drive your legs. So if you've ever seen soccer players run, they run like this because they're used <laughs> to guarding, but that's a lot of energy wasted in this rotational motion, right? So like if, and there are a lot of things to keep track of when you start running or when you are running. So just picking one thing at a time, be like, I'm gonna focus on like what my arms are doing today or like for this part of the run and putting some energy into thinking about that then you'll kind of notice, oh yeah, I do that. So I'm going to make a note to like work on this every time I'm on the run, but like use your arms. Even if you think, I think people always think I look weird when I run because I really use my arms, but like they help me use my butt. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I don't care if I look crazy. Um, and keeping your shoulders really relaxed. Here's what I see my athletes do towards the end of a race. <laughs> and I'm like, just relax your shoulders. Like things are going to be way better. Um, so just little check-ins of like, how, how are my arms doing? Am I, am I like up here? Am I relaxed or not? Um, and then not doing anything crazy with your hands. You don't need to be like clenching your fists. That's not where your energy, you want, you want your energy to be going, right? Like I always imagine like I'm holding a potato chip. I don't want to like squeeze it and squish it, but I'm like just keeping my hands really loose and like really relaxed because you should be really relaxed up here and then doing a bunch of work with, um, with your legs. And especially when you're going up hills and stuff like your, your arms are really going to help you drive. Um, and I guess one of the big thing I think people mentioned in the beginning was like, oh, I'm kind of like, there's a lot, of, there's a lot going on with trail running. If you shorten up those strides and then scan like 10 to 15 feet ahead of you. So I'm not sure where you normally are looking when you're running, but you don't really need to look at your feet. <laughs> like if you're looking 10 or 15 feet in front of you, you're going to be able to plan how you want to move your feet ahead of time so that you're not just staring down. It's already too late if you're right on that rock stubbing your toe or something like that. Um, so, and depending on what kind of trail, so like Moscow mountain, there's not really a lot of obstacles a lot of the time. It's like, okay, this is really just nice, um, sort of mud with pine needles on it. If you get into more technical stuff, just slow down a little bit more <laughs> and then you'll have a little bit more time to react to that kind of thing. And I will say this kind of takes practice too. It's kind of hard, right? Especially when you know, there's like, okay, I know there's a rock and I should be stepping over it at some point. I saw it like a second ago and you like want to look down and then you just get all messed up. So it does, it takes a lot of practice, but I think Hannah slowing down is really helpful. Um, 
And that's kind of what I did. Cause again, I started in the desert and it's all rocks and boulders and such. And so definitely took a lot of practice to get that, to get that going. So I feel like when you're running on a road, yeah, you look a little ahead, but not, not quite as far, you know? Yeah. You can basically close your eyes when you're running. <laughs> also important because of tree branches. I learned that lesson once when I was looking down too quick. Luckily it was a pretty small branch, but it still hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I always think like when things get a little bit technical for me, like I've got really long legs and I'm not the most coordinated person. So my strides go from being like this to like, doo -doo 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 -doo. like, I'm just trying to like run around things. And it seems kind of like jostling around, but like I'm saying, like, that's, that's good because then you're working sort of those muscles, doing different things and strengthening like your whole hips and stuff. These people are sprinting up this hill, Whew, which I, we're going to talk about in the next slide. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing that um, unless you are one of those ultra people. But yeah, so just a couple more techniques uh, up and down hills kind of thing. So try to land. This one's not really intuitive, right? You're going downhill. You kind of think land on your heels, especially if you've done like snowshoeing or other things, right? You want to heel first, but it's actually better for trail running to land like midfoot, right? Lessen that impact on your joint um, and you can serve that momentum, right? You're not, it's not so much of a stop motion. And then I thought this good, this is such a good picture with the wing out of arms for balance. So this is exactly what you look like, right? It's like that balancing on a tightrope, but it's a little more close to the body when you're running. Um, but it does, it really does help a lot. So those like wing out arms for balance. Um, and then climbs. So other way, it's keep the same cadence, which is the number of steps you take like an hour, right? So you're not increasing or decreasing like crazy, right? Keep it kind of the same, shorten your stride a little bit. Um, and then if it's if it's too steep, like that last picture, or even this one, if you're not comfortable just sprinting downhill over these tree roots, just hike, right? That's trail running becomes a hike and it's perfect. Um, fast hike, better than a run. I like that, right? When it's too steep or technical, just slow it down. Um, don't, don't push yourself, especially at the beginning, too much, too fast. But it, and it just kind of becomes more of a habit and instinct the more you do it. Yeah, and I will say like, I don't normally think hiking's too bad. You're like, all right, like I, I feel okay, like at this pace. But when you stop to run to hike, hiking is now the hardest thing <laughs> that you have done. Like obviously running up would be harder, but you're like already so tired. So kind of, I think there's a good picture on the next slide, but how you, it's called power hiking. is you kind of hinge at the hips and then like physically put your hands on your legs and sort of like push them down as you walk up. Like it looks really ridiculous, but and you'll be like, why do they do that? But then when you do it for the first time, you'll be like, I would be on the ground if I <laughs> were doing this. So this is great. Um, and just like Jen says, like this person, I would never be going downhill as fast as this person because look at all of those obstacles. Um, it does seem counterintuitive to like land on your forefoot. And that might be a bit of a stretch for when getting started, but just being cognizant of like when you're landing on your heel you're breaking and you're wasting your energy which is okay if that's what you're comfortable with um but like as as you're experimenting see how you can kind of take advantage of the hound downhills at certain times oh, we'll go back and see if there are any questions no oh, i think we're all good Okay, so wouldn't be a presentation by the ORC if we didn't talk about leave no trace, which are these principles that kind of give us guidance on how to care for the outdoors. Um, and Jen's got that link in the chat, which is great. Uh, there's so much good information. If you're a hiker or a runner or anything, like hopefully you know about leave no trace um, because it gives us some principles for like, hey, I really want the outdoors to stay nice because I like to use them and other people like to use them. Future generations should get to use them. Um, here's how we can keep it as nice as possible for everybody. And so we've just kind of pulled out some aspects of leave no trace. Um, <laughs> yep, especially if you're with me because I have worked as a ranger and so really enjoy the home on the LMT stuff. So um, the first one is trail etiquette. Uh, you want to yield to other groups. Always be like a nice trail user. <laughs> so like if you're running fast, it's, you know, it's not about I need to get done with this trail run with a certain amount of time. Like make sure that you're, uh, you're being a good trail user and not like running over people on bikes or kids or people with dogs, like just be, just be chill. Um, and usually it's people who are coming uphill, have the right of way. So don't be like barreling down the trail and run 
run someone over. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, trail runners kind of get a bad rep, but some of them are kind of. I do. <laughs> I work as a ranger for in the enchantments, and that is a thing that people trail run usually, and they're just like, "Get out of my way!" And I'm like, "This is a 20 mile run." <laughs> Like, I am not, like, is, is being rude to me, like, worth the two seconds? No, like, what's wrong with you? Um, so keep that in mind. People who have uphill have their, have their right away. And just sometimes people have music in too. So if, if someone doesn't notice that you're coming up on them, just give them a little, like, hey, on your left. Uh, probably will spook them, but better than just, like, barreling them over. Um, the second is erosion. Um, don't cut switchbacks. First of all, that seems harder because it will be steeper. And also like you're, you're damaging the trails because when you do that, it defeats the integrity of the trail. And then that whole hillside kind of slides and it ruins all the wonderful trail work that people are doing and the vegetation just makes it not as nice for everybody. And even if there already are trails, I guarantee you the service and the public land that's watching it doesn't want that. They're trying to get rid of it and they want you to use the switchbacks. Plus switchbacks are way nicer for hiking and running. Um, we talked about this a little bit in gear, but having a bathroom plan. So even if you're not like many miles out, like if you know that you're someone who every time you go on a trail run, you have to take a bathroom break, um, that's not number one. Like you probably need to carry like a trowel and paper to be with you. Because imagine if you do that same run and a lot of other people do, and a lot of other people have your problem, that ends up being a lot of like poo that's just like laying not that far from the trail. And so I know like running just makes me have to use the bathroom. So I'm always carrying this stuff with me. Um, because I don't want to be a bad trail user. <laughs> Moscow Mountain gets a lot of use. Let's keep it really nice for everybody. Um, and then the last one is wildlife. So um, I have seen, let's see, moose and bear at Moscow Mountain before. So there are things out there. Um, so I think a lot of people have worries about animals and mo for the most part, they're not really out there. They're more scared of you. But if you are worried, I would just avoid running at dawn or dusk. That's when you see the most wildlife uh, walking around. And especially if you're in areas where they're like, oh, there's mountain lion sightings, like bring your dog and just don't go during those times when like those animals are most active. Um, and if you are also, if you're running with a dog, you probably want to keep them on a leash so they're not just like running around everywhere to disturb the wildlife that is around. Um, do you want to add anything, Jen? No, I, th I think that really covers it. Again, there's more L and T, but these are these are kind of the biggest ones when it comes to trail running um, specifically. And yes, trail running with my dog, it, the leash does, you know, again, just another thing to think about as she's pulling, but uh, really important for L and T and pre preserving the wildlife. I was actually, um, in the fall, I was up at Hayburn State Park, not too far, it's about 45 minutes north of us in Idaho. And I was hiking with my dog and we saw a cougar and my heart stopped, first of all, but I was so glad she was on a leash and we just kind of slowly backtracked and took a different trail and we were fine, but they're out there. So just, just kind of be aware, know where you're going, plan ahead. Mm -hmm. Not meant to scare you at all. Just No, you no, should... just, just prepare you, prepare you, not scare you. <laughs> I am running many many places like as I worked as a ranger we would set up for the night and then I'd be like I want to go explore this new area like I'm gonna go turn up to this thing and I would be running and it would be dusk and I would see like huge cougar poops and I'd be looking around and it's like rocky terrain and I was like this is like absolutely where cougar would love to live and definitely does live and I just remember <laughs> thinking the whole time like I have the most euphoria right now it's so beautiful I'm really enjoying myself really like nice grade of running and also just thinking like I might get eaten on my way down and it ended up being okay so um you know it was really thrilling um <laughs> and even though there definitely was a cougar around there like he left me alone so thank you cougar. <laughs> Nice. Also, not to scare you, but prepare you. Common injuries um, do happen when, you know, you're doing anything, really. I walk around my house and I hurt myself. But when it comes to trail running, um, some ones you probably have already thought about, especially those are training for half marathons and such. Um, chafing, one. So a good solution to this one is body glide. It's kind I explained it kind of like deodorant for reducing I, that's the only way I can think of it. Just look it up. Um, but it's just like a, you know, a application to your skin so that you're, um, when you're running, right, it's not creating that chafing feeling. It just slides right next to each other. So avoid that. Um, rolled ankles, obviously another common one. This is just where it's kind of, you know, if you're getting to 
little tricky terrain, slow it down, really be conscious of where you're stepping, how you're stepping, um, but be prepared that that might happen, right? So have food, water, extra layers, and anything you might need if you need to walk out or it takes you a little bit longer to get out. Cuts and scrapes, pretty self-explanatory. Again, ran into a tree branch, definitely, definitely got a scrape on that one. Um, you know, not something you technically have to worry about right then and there, but something to address. Um, and, you know, having, if you already have a backpack or a fanny pack, uh, throwing some band-aids or cleaning wipes or something in there doesn't hurt and doesn't weigh a lot. And then uh, again, back to the winter cold trail running, um, just considering this right with your own layers and your time outside um, hypothermia or hyperthermia, knowing what happens, what signs and symptoms you might start to experience if you're getting towards that, um, or if you're out with someone else, right, and they're starting to act a little off, knowing what that might lead to and how to address it is kind of one of the important ones. Hannah, anything on that or any questions on just the acute ones? Pretty straightforward, I think. Yeah, I would say like you're probably not going to have global full-blown hypo or hypothermia, yeah. but like you can start to like be having some heat illness, like especially like when it's really hot out, like <laughs> there's some of my athletes on in high school sometimes where I'm like, oh, like you need to go sit in the shade and drink water and not do anything else. Just cause like it's 90 degrees out. It's really hard to stay hydrated <laughs> if you're in full sun, which actually is why trail running is great when it's shaded. Cause it can be 90 out, but feel like way nicer. <laughs> yeah. um, so just being aware of those things and bringing water and knowing, knowing when it's worth stopping and turning around. Yeah, absolutely. Which I think we talk about um, later, but, and then some long-term issues, right. Coming back from an injury, you, I, like I said, I have some knee and arch problems already. Um, and so some important things to consider really warming up and what we call dynamic stretching, which is, you know, stretches while you're moving a little bit, adding, adding a little movement into it rather, rather than static stretching. Um, and this is something you can easily look up, right? Dynamic stretching for runners and you'll get some really cool examples. Um, build up slowly, right? So Again, if you have some ache or pain or something, don't, don't go hard right out of the gate. Build up to that, build up to your goal. Uh, feel your body for success. I love this one. And I'm not always the best at it. I tend to, you know, eat what I want sometimes. Um, but before a run becomes a little more important, right? Know what you're putting in your body, make sure you're hydrating um, and getting what you need. And then yes, this one, right? Winners know when to quit and walk it out or take time off, right? Don't, don't push yourself. Again, trail running, make it, make it what you want. Um, especially those who are like training for half marathons, right? You know, if you're feeling a little something, you, you gotta back off a little bit, slow it down, work through that before you can keep going or else it just, it gets worse, right? Before it gets better. So just kind of keep that in mind as you, as you start out. Yes, clean eating is hard, I feel you. That's funny because when I wrote this, feel your body for success, I was like, don't go on a diet. Like you need to have calories in your body because running is hard. So I'm thinking like, make sure you eat your carbs. Like, But, see, like, but you're eating the right things. I'm saying like, yeah. I like to just, you know, a handful of Oreos that has no what? benefit so, for right running. <laughs> for running though, like if you have ever worked an aid station or heard of them, like, um, they, like they hate super weird foods. There's like Oreos and like potatoes dipped in salt and pb and j sandwich and some weird stuff. random stuff so like honestly i would say like whatever your body craves like <laughs> you but see, again you got to know for those people they are burning all of that off so quickly because they're doing extensive runs right i'm not to that point <laughs> those okay. oreos are just staying with me you'll too like if you need fast energy in a run things that give you fast energy are simple sugars right so there's like gels and gummy bears and things like that um, whereas like if you're on a run and you eat a PB and J, like that's not, you're not going to get that energy for a while. <laughs> that's a lot of protein and, fat. Mm -hmm. and like sit like a brick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maple syrup packets. Ooh, interesting. That's very Canadian. Ooh, I could see that. Yeah. I forget what race I was at where they were handing them out, but I'd used some of the gels before and I'm not a huge fan, yeah, but it's literally not. just like a looks like a ketchup packet, but it's full of maple syrup. And I'm from Vermont originally. And I was like, well, this is perfect. Um, and it's, it's great. It's easy to get down. It's not as like thick and yeah. gluey as some of the gels are. I love them. Yeah. I like that. That's so interesting. Like 
maple syrup is fructose, which has to be metabolized by your liver first. So versus glucose that can go right to your muscles. So that's interesting. I'm going to look that into that, the biochemist. Anyway, um, yeah, so not to scare you, like we're saying, prepare you, all this stuff is going to keep you sort of like in the game, happy. It's kind of the same things for normal running or hiking <laughs> as well. Nice. And I think the rest are all resources for you. So now it's, it, and actually while Hannah's talking, I'll put some of these links in chat. Oh, oops. Yeah. So here's some, there's some really great phone apps that you can get for finding runs. So all trails will just help you find trails. Um, but you can kind of look at the elevation profile and reviews. And if people are like, oh my God, like this was killing me. Maybe it's like not so good for a trail run. It might be a little bit steep. Um, but that's a good place to find stuff. Also Washington Trail Association, WTA. Um, they're a great place to find different trails. Like you can kind of search by region. Um, trail run project is an app I just found and it shows like trail runs that people have tagged other places. There's not a ton around our area. We'll go over some local resources, but if you're in Seattle, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that's kind of close and there is some good stuff near Troy ish, but once that melts out, cause that area stays like, pretty snowy for a while. Mamba is the association that helps manage Moscow mountain. So if you go to their website, they've got a, an app and there's so many mountain bike trails that are used by runners um, as well that, I mean, you could run a different trail every day probably um, or hike one. And so that's a great resource too. And I think they just got a new app. So like you can download it. So while you're out, there's a kind of a lot of junctions sometimes. And so you'll be like, where am I? I don't want to get lost. <laughs> like, um, you can use that to, to help you out too. So lots of good resources for finding stuff wherever, wherever you might be. And there are more too. These are just kind of the big ones mm -hmm. um, to start with yeah. if you're, if you're starting out. Um, and like she said, here's some local running options for those who are in Pullman, which seems to be most of us. Um, on campus, Arboretum, um, or I will say there's a better one in Moscow, but there is an Arboretum in Pullman. That is, it's pretty nice. Um, all the many, many farm roads you drive by, uh, just, just, you know, start running down them. It's they're so it's, good. <laughs> they are. They're like, you get the gradual hills, right? So you get used to that slight up and down, but they're pretty clear and level and a good place to start. And when the canola is in season, oh, you're so like running through. It's really wonderful. <laughs> yes, it's beautiful. Um, also, just off campus, Magpie Forest. It's, I don't know if you any of you have been there, but it's like a half mile hike up to this little like grove of trees, maybe a mile. Um, really nice, but again, just a little off-roading. You can try pretty local. Um, and that's a link to a brochure from the city with all the different trails. I will say though, many of those are paved. Um, so if you're trying to get off concrete, just, just kind of pay attention to that. And then moving a little wider out, Colfax Trail. Um, I'm sure you many of you have heard of, but that's just that six mile trail. Kamiak Butte, um, I have done a little trail running there. A little steep at times. I definitely do some walking, um, which is perfect. You know, it's a good place to start, you know, running where you want and walking when you want. But that three mile one um, is, a, is a great loop if you have a dog, or you can do the four mile one if you don't have a dog with you um, that adds that extra primitive trail, which I think last time I did it, it was still pretty obvious to see and find. So another option. Yeah. Um, Moscow Mountain, so many options which are all great again a good place to practice that trail running that's the mixture of running and walking on some of on some of those areas um, but also to push yourself if you're getting to that point and then a few one of the longer ones um moose marbles i i don't know if i've done the whole 10 miles and i don't know if you have but wow. i've done parts of it and it's really nice mm -hmm. And then Spring Valley Reservoir, a little bit shorter. Um, that's just past Troy. So a little bit further out there if you have a car. But there are options is what we're saying to get started, and especially now that the weather is like perfect. Like now is the time for running outside. So a really great idea too is like just pull up Google Maps and like you can look at farm roads and like, oh, this looks like, and then it will show you from the spring. And so sometimes farmers plant different stuff. You're like, oh, wow, like canola is growing here. I bet this would be really pretty. And you just kind of, and like Jen's saying, there's plenty of flat and then also some hills. So it's really nice. And you know what? You're going to see absolutely zero other people out there. <laughs> like I never see anybody and it's awesome. 
Um, and then just for some info about the seasons, like Moscow Mountain is probably not going to melt out until April or later. Like it takes a while to melt out. Headwaters is going to melt melt out first. Um, but I always think that it's going to be fine. And I'm always like <laughs> in up to my knee, like trying to bike. And I'm like, nope, I am just not tired. It. And it's not quite summer yet. But Kamiak, um, we just did get a lot of snow. So it's probably still snowy there. But Kamiak will melt out like much sooner. And the farm roads melt out super quick. And stuff in um, stuff in Pullman too. So lots of options. Would recommend those apps. Um, so. And then if you ever are interested in doing a race, there are some local ones and also some finders. So Moscow always does one um, for the headwaters loop. So there's the six mile loop. And then there is, um, they do a half marathon and I think like a 50 K or something. So like definitely do the six mile loop because that's like all the joy and like not the bad stuff. Um, and then like leave and people will be running for like six more hours but that's something that's kind of fun and local to do I've never done it because I've always like kind of been injured but I really was I really want to uh so maybe I'll see you there um but there's also a good finder where you're like oh I'm like gonna go on vacation here and I won't run a trail race or like I want to have something to train for because there's a bunch of different stuff that is like do you want to do something super crazy where it's like running in sand dunes or, or something like that, um, or something more normal, like the salt flats. Like there's a whole bunch of different stuff. It's just a different way to experience it if you're into that. Um, and there's also a lot of resources for like more trail running specific, like training if you want to do trail races. But it sounds like most of us just like want to get in it for the joy, which I think is amazing. So that's just like, you know, push yourself to do what you want <laughs> and like get out of it what you like and use it to supplement you know, running for training for your marathon or whatever. Um, because some of this stuff gets kind of crazy for sure. <laughs> and I think, oh yeah, here's our last slide. So this is a new series of programs. So this, um, this, uh, webinar as well as our trail run. So on March 15th, we're doing an on-campus trail run at the Arboretum. We're just gonna talk about more of these techniques and practice it. And there are some kind of steep hills that we will be power hiking up and kind of talk about some dynamic stretching and things like that. Um, so it should be kind of fun. We're just sort of piloting this new program. Um, and then on April 18th, we're going to do one at Kamiak Butte where we'll go up sort of the least steep side of things, um, chill at the top, taking the views, and then kind of decide what we want to do from there. Because no matter how you do it, that primitive side is not really good for running. It's really steep on the way up. And on the way down, it's also too steep. Like I would like face plant. Um, but uh, those are two options for you if you're going to be near Pullman and want to check those out. Um, but if there we have a little bit of time left if people want to ask questions, anything that we like didn't cover that you wanted to cover or want to know about, I'm sure we have some information like off the top of our heads. 50-50. <laughs> I know you said that Nikes aren't great for the screw thing. Is there a brand of shoes that you guys prefer or that you lean towards? Um, that's your favorite for trail, not necessarily a trail running shoe specifically, but just a sneaker that you prefer when you go out and hit the trails. Um, I mean, I shouldn't knock on Nike so much. It's like, you know what the style is. It's like all foam and like really thin and really flimsy. That's what I'm talking about is not great for the ice shoe. Um, a lot of people like Brooks Cascadia's they have a lot of rubber. Um, I can grab mine actually to show you when I'm done talking. But another brand that people use a lot are, um, oh, it's not Scarpa. What is it? I use Asics. Oh. Mm -hmm. They have very thick soles, um, good for arches is why I get them. But I've never tried this crew thing, but I do. They're, they're pretty for just, I, you know, I switch between, I have trail runners too, but my Asics are actually pretty solid for short trail runs. People love Solomon. There's a lot of things to choose from. For me, they're not cushiony enough. I need a really cushiony shoe because I have really bony feet, but there's a lot of different kinds of tread on those. Um, and they even have some that you don't have to tie. It's more of like a biking style lacing system. So you don't have to worry about your laces coming undone. Um, my husband loves those. And um, I would say Solomon is the main one. Brooks is another big one. 
Nike does have a trail runner that has really good reviews. I've just never personally used it. Um, Brooks has some trail runners as well. So if there's a brand that you normally like that works for your foot for normal running, I would say just try to find their trail running version. And see. That's what I did for ASICs. I use ASICs trail running version. I know some other trail runners are like advertised that they're Gore-Tex and they're waterproof or is that, have you found that to be important? I, I worry about my foot sweating inside of that yeah. twice as much as it would in a nor Okay. So yeah, I, <laughs> right. I would recommend them unless you plan on running like solely in rain and swampy and you know, you want that. I don't plan on running through too many rivers. Yeah. yeah. River running. Exactly. <laughs> if you're running through a river and it's like, you're probably not winter. I hope you're not running through a river in winter your shoe's going to dry out way faster if it's not waterproof. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I would, I would probably stay away from that unless it's like, that would be a really niche shoe for very specific purposes. Um, and then I think you would ask something else, or maybe I just thought of something else. Oh, a lot of trail runners like ultras is a brand that is pretty popular. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would take a look at what your normal shoe has for drop. So the, the, whatever height from your heel. Cause if you're used to something with like a four millimeter or nine millimeter drop, like there's a difference between where your ball and your heel of your foot is. And you go to an ultra, which is zero drop, your calves are going to be on fire. So if you want to try a zero drop shoe, I would say wear them to work, wear them around and get used to them walking before you try running, because otherwise you're going to have Achilles problems and you might pull something in your calf. <laughs> Um, not to scare you, you definitely can transition there, but don't just like go to the, like, I'm going to go hard <laughs> with these new shoes. Um, I've just seen that happen to a lot of people I know. So ease into them if you want to try that. And I just put a link that it's backcountry.com is usually my go-to. Um, but they actually have some, like, they call them just running shoes, but they're trail running because it's all backcountry stuff. Um, and they have most of the brands that Hannah just mentioned, um, uh, if you're looking you know, once you, once you get into it a little bit more, um, to see what's out there, but there's, there's a bunch out there and they do have some, they have the ultra, the Nike, Adidas, Solomon, Under Armour, everything. Another one that I just thought of that some people like as well as hookah one, hookah, hookah, or hookah, yep. one, one. hookah one, one. Hookah yeah. one, one. They're like super cushiony, but some people swear by them. Um, and love them. And they also have a line. So if they is usually a shoe that you wear for running, you might look at them or try them out. Like, I think they look silly. So I've never tried them, but they, people they who have like that soccer bottom. Almost. Yeah. Here's yeah. one I use. And I mean, like I got them cause they were the cheapest ones. So like, it's not cause I love them, but you'll see, like, they've got a lot more going on for them. Like rugged, rugged wise in terms of leather. And then this is like sturdier yeah. and it's a little bit more flat. Um, yeah, but I hope this inspires you to get out and try trail running, um, and join one of our trips or convince a friend or anything like that. Um,